Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend. Today we're going to be digging into, experimenting with an 18th century dish called burgoo. What is burgoo? Thanks for coming along with us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So burgoo is one of those terms that shows up if you study the life of sailors in the 18th century. It shows up in memoirs, uh, in different sort of references, and sometimes even in dictionaries or plays, right? And uh, I always read that stuff and I say, burgoo, that sounds very exciting. It sounds very strange. What is it? They don't explain it. Um, but I've got this wonderful memoir of a seafaring life by Spavins. He wrote this in 1796. And the great part about this book is later on, he goes through and explains everything about a sailor's life in the 18th century. He was a sailor from, uh, I think, 1755 all the way up through uh, 1765. So it's a great section. And let me read to you about the food that sailors eat or um, British sailors uh, ate in the 18th century. In page 106, he talks about provisions here. He says, Every man and boy born on the books of any of His Majesty's ships are allowed as following a pound of biscuit bread um, and a gallon of beer per day. So, uh, a gallon of beer a day. Maybe that's not so bad, right? Um, <laughs> on Tuesdays and Saturdays, two pounds of beef or else a pound of beef and a pound of flour with plums for pudding. Uh, let's see. On Thursdays and Sundays, uh, every two men has three pounds, uh, three pounds of pork and a pint of peas to boil them into a soup. The other three days are banyan days. Those are days without meat. Um, each one of those days, he gets two ounces of butter, a quarter pound of cheese. On Wednesdays, you get burgoo boiled for breakfast and a pint of peas to make soup for dinner. On Mondays, no peas but you get burgoo for dinner. That's what you get when you're a sailor on board ship each and every week. Two of those days we get burgoo. What is burgoo? Well, burgoo is uh, ground oatmeal boiled up. Now, uh, you wouldn't necessarily eat that all by itself. Uh, early on, you were given to go with that uh, salt beef fat. So the slush that came to the top of when you're boiling all your salt beef or salt pork, you get all that fat that goes up on top, they would scrape that off, they'd keep that and give it to you to go with your burgoo. But later on, they said maybe that caused scurvy, so they let you have some molasses instead. Let's make up some burgoo. So this is gonna be so very, very simple. I've got some water boiling up here. I'm not even sure quite exactly how much, uh, <laughs> but uh, probably about um, four or five cups. I'm gonna add just a touch of salt, and uh, it's, it's likely on board ship. They have all the salt they need, so they would add salt to this. Now you can imagine, they're gonna be cooking this in a giant copper vat, because they have to cook uh, food for, even a, even a small ship might have 50 or 60 men, a, a military ship, um, a frigate, 200 men, ship of the line, um, 400, 500, 600 men you're gonna to have to cook for. So. Uh, we've got some oatmeal here that's already kind of uh, ground up and we're going to slowly add that and stir it. And the ratio on this is probably about uh, three to one oatmeal to water. They might cook this up for a long time, let it get very, very thick. Um, but you can imagine at other times they had to make this in a hurry and it would be a thin gruel. Uh, depending on what their what their provisions were like, whether they were running low or not. So there's another term that shows up if you're reading about sailors' food, and that's loblolly. And that's actually an earlier term for the same thing. The same thing as burgoo. Uh, it really kind of means a, a frothing, bubbling, uh, cooking mess. And so they would they would use that same term, and and uh, slowly over time they dropped that loblolly term, and burgoo became the the name for the same thing. Okay, here's our burgoo. It's all done. I just added our uh, our molasses in there, and um, 
I mean, I can imagine that they might have used a, blaps, a blackstrap molasses, something with a lot of flavor that was very, very cheap uh, for these sailors. I tried to use, I, I like uh, baking molasses a little better than blackstrap. Uh, but that's it. It's really just oatmeal, uh, water. We didn't use any milk. We didn't use any cream um, and molasses uh, boiled up. Let's find out how this burgoo turned out. Yeah, I, I can imagine, I can see all these sailors, they're all, you know, at their tables and they're eating up their, <laughs> they're eating up their burku. Um, it's good. It would, it would keep you going. It would keep you energized for the day and a very, very cheap ration. I'm not sure I can imagine it with a whole bunch of slush on it, you know, the, um, the, uh, that grease and oil from the top of the cooking thing. But if you're an officer, maybe maybe you've got a special version of burgoo. You're gonna add a little nutmeg to it just to give it some a wonderful flavor, right? So let's add a little nutmeg. We're gonna make our officer's version of burgoo. Find out how, how what that's gonna do to it. I'll bet you now it's gonna be something special. Even the smell of nutmeg adds something to it. Hmm. Now, there you go. That, that is a wonderful burgoo. So this may have seemed like a super simple recipe, and it is, but it's so, so steeped in history. Uh, this wasn't just sailor's food. Uh, it was food for everyday folk all over. Uh, uh, soldiers are going to be eating something like this. Just regular folk everywhere, especially poor people. This is going to be a very, very common dish. So every time we dig into something like a, a nice, simple oatmeal, we can, we can connect back with those people in the 18th century. We can live like just like them. And next time you're having oatmeal for breakfast, you can tell everybody, no, no, we're not having oatmeal. We're not going to have burgoo. So there are some recipes where you just read the title of it and it's intriguing. And then the more you read, the more confused you are. This is one of those recipes. This is from the professed cook. Uh, Claremont uh, does this book in 1769, and it's it's a um, it's a translation of French a French cookery book into the English vernacular. And this one's called Coffee Eggs or Eggs with Coffee. And generally, we think about those things as two separate things, not putting them together into a single dish. And this one's strange in that it is not very complicated, but and the two main ingredients are eggs and coffee. Um, not two things I would, I would normally just kind of put together like that. Uh, make some good strong coffee. Let it rest to clear as usual. Sweeten it with sugar according to discretion. Beat up six egg yolks, or beat up the yolks of six eggs, uh, with about four cups of coffee sift it pour this into little molds in the form of eggs or any other do not fill them quite bake them in a mild oven or a dutch oven um, in the shapes of any fruits or birds if you have proper molds for it either of copper or china etc etc uh, so uh, interesting it's basically a uh, coffee uh, the egg yolks and what sugar you add, and then they're baked in little forms. I don't understand how this is gonna turn out. The only way to figure this one out is to do it. So let's get started. So everybody knows I'm not a big fan of coffee. The crew here is always drinking coffee, but not me. Uh, but I'm willing to go out on a limb here and try this one out because it's just so weird and strange. Again, we don't need very many ingredients. We've got some eggs, I've got some sugar, and we've got our good strong coffee. Uh, we don't need any incredible equipment except for the molds. And that's kind of the tricky part with this one. I've got these little molds I actually made up specific for this purpose. Uh, they're little deep sort of half egg uh, shapes. And you could use maybe, well, I don't know what kind of molds you're, you're gonna use, but this is, a, <laughs> this is a little mold that we're gonna use today. Uh, let me get these mixing up. We're gonna start off with six egg yolks already in our bowl, ready to go. And I'm gonna whisk these up. Won't take very much at all. We're gonna add coffee, and it, it, it talks about cups of coffee, but we don't actually know how big these cups of coffee are. And 
Uh, baking this, it seems like there's an awful lot of coffee here. So I'm gonna cut this back to approximately two ounces of coffee per egg yolk. And that means that if we've got six egg yolks in here, I'm gonna add in 12 ounces of coffee. Maybe their coffee cups are small. Let me tell you, this does not look promising, does smell promising to me, uh, <laughs> but we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, make sure your coffee isn't too hot. You don't wanna cook these eggs when you put them in. This was just kind of nice and warm, and I left it nice and warm so that um, we could still get this uh, sugar to dissolve. You can dissolve your sh sugar in first. Uh, I'm gonna do it here just in this section. Again, it's the sugar's up to you about how sweet you want it. And I'm just gonna whisk this until my sugar gets dissolved. This is very uh, watery consistency, but I've been fooled on uh, these kinds of things before where you think, you know, what you're gonna bake just will never, you know, never thicken up, never turn into what you want. And this is supposed to go into a mold and come out of it and hold its shape. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't bet that from from what it is right this second. I'm just uh, whisking it to get it uh, fully mixed, I'm not trying to whip any great quantity of air into this. So I don't know if this is the right consistency or not, but uh, we're gonna start putting it in to our little molds. And it's sad, of course, that they might grow a little bit, so don't fill them all the way up. Here we go. Those are filled up, ready to go into the oven. I'm gonna put these on a little tray just in case. Uh, we're gonna put these in a slow oven. So um, in a modern oven, maybe 300 degrees or so. Uh, also, make sure on these little molds that they, uh, that they release. So you'll probably wanna butter your molds even though you know, the recipe didn't mention that, but I went ahead and buttered these guys and I'm gonna get these in the oven and I'm guessing Hmm, about a half hour. It's one of those things you'll have to watch and hopefully they'll solidify up and, and do what they're supposed to do. I have no idea, but I'll get these in the oven. Well, uh, they're here, they're ready to try. I, I, uh, it took a little bit to get them to release from the molds. Uh, I did cook them a little bit longer, 35 minutes or so for these uh, because the molds were heavy enough that they took a little bit to come up to heat and put them on a little, you wanna put them on a bed of greens or something. Uh, we thought maybe spinach leaves, these are mint leaves because they're, I think it's, I think this is more of a dessert thing. I don't know. Uh, Oh, I don't know if it's time to try these or not. Um, maybe a different mold style would make them look a little, they're kind of jiggly, interesting looking. Let's try it out. Uh, okay, they, they're holding together really nicely. Well, that's probably actually pretty good. Um, let me try again. Uh, this has got, I probably added just a little bit more sugar than I might have, because I was guessing. So they definitely have a, a wonderful sweetness to them. They've got this really, really interesting texture. Soft, uh, but with, with enough body to them so that they're not, they're just on this side of, or you know, just on the firm side of falling apart. But they have this really, really fun texture to them really nice the coffee comes through so it really matters what kind of coffee you're going to use uh, and the eggs just hold that together so it's um, like coffee pudding right um, but very very few ingredients this isn't really a custard it doesn't have any milk doesn't have any cream in it hmm. if I had to eat coffee this would be the way to do it 
This is actually a, a really good, fun way, simple way to have a little dessert uh, that isn't too difficult to make. I'm gonna call this definitely a success. I like this one. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today we're gonna to be looking at a fascinating topic, spruce beer. Thanks for joining us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Spruce beer has this incredibly rich history. It's not only yummy, but it's important as a, a health property. And it's so important that it's part of the military rations. Let me read to you a piece from 1775, General Orders. And here's Congress, and they're talking about rations for soldiers. Uh, each, uh, the following ration of provisions is allowed by Continental Congress to each soldier. A pound of fresh beef, a pound of bread, three pints of peas, that's per week, not per day, a pint of milk per day per man if it's available, a half pint of rice per man per week, and here's the good one, a quart of spruce beer uh, per man per day, or we'll get to this later on, nine gallons of molasses per company of 100 men per week. So there it is showing up right there in the military rations in 1775. This is drank by just regular people. It's, it's soldiers and sailors, people in fortifications. It's incredibly important in the 18th century. So what exactly is spruce beer? It's technically not truly a beer by a modern sense, but it's made in very similar way. It's, it's also very, very similar to the ginger beer that we've made in the past, if you've seen that episode. But the major sort of flavoring ingredient and the major portion of its medicinal properties come from spruce. And the spruce that's mainly used in the 18th century is black spruce. That's the spruce everybody wants, uh, but that really only grows in the very, very northern part of North America. So, you know, maybe Massachusetts and north, sort of the half, uh, halfway in Michigan and north of that, of course, all over Canada, you have black spruce. Uh, sometimes people use white spruce in the time period. And if you're down south, say in South Carolina, you would use pine doesn't make nearly as good a spruce beer, but some people did make it up. And spruce beer has this, has this um, history that goes all the way back, say, into the 17th century. Um, Native Americans were helping out those folks in, in Canada that were sick with scurvy. They made a spruce drink, not really a beer, but a drink, and uh, that cured them. They, they, uh, the, the Europeans sort of converted that and said, let's make beer out of it instead. Well, it turns out that when you boil spruce, you get rid of all the wonderful vitamin C that was really good for it, but people still considered it a health drink. So we need to have uh, the ingredient of spruce in our spruce beer. How are we gonna make that? That's what we're gonna do. We need to collect up some spruce cuttings. Let's go out and get some spruce cuttings. We want some nice, soft, uh, spruce trees if we can get it and this is the perfect time of year early summer we got some new growth here this nice green part soft tender it's got a lot of good flavor to it if it's winter time and you've only got the older growth that's what they did if they needed uh, spruce and they needed that vitamin C even in the winter you could still go to your your uh, spruce tree it's still green you can get some cuttings from that we've got our cuttings and I kind of chopped them down a little bit uh, and now we just toss them into some boiling water and, and uh, really we just need, we're just going to cover them up with as much water as possible. And the recipes all sort of agree that we boil this uh, for an hour, two hours until the bark starts to peel off of the stick. Um, the, the problem with that is, is really the, the, the vitamin C that's built into spruce, that's the, really the good part, the healing part, it gets destroyed by this boiling process. So uh, they did this in the 18th century. They didn't know that that was what was happening. There is a caveat here that I also want to give, and that is we have to be careful about what we're cutting. We can't just go out into, you know, into the yard or into the forest and 
cut any old willy-nilly evergreen because there are some evergreens that are poisonous. The wonderful thing about a spruce tree is the whole thing is basically edible. It's really weird. Uh, you can get, you know, peel off the inner bark raw and eat it. You can eat the nettles. You can eat the sticks. You can eat everything on a spruce tree. It's actually good for you right off the tree. Uh, but if you get something like a juniper or some kinds of cedar, they're poisonous. So know your tree before you go cutting. You can boil this for approximately an hour. Now that this is done, all we have to do is strain the liquid out and leave the pine needles behind. So one of the very, very interesting things about this is you would think it would have this super piney smell, but actually it has this wonderful sort of food smell to it. Uh, it really, really smells good. So while we can make our own spruce essence and many recipes talk about making spruce essence, most of the recipes actually refer straight to spruce essence as a product that you could buy. And, and they were making spruce essence and selling it um, all over, most of the recipes, the vast majority actually say just use spruce essence. And today we can still buy spruce essence. You can find it um, at a brewing supply store that's uh, close to you, or you can find it on Amazon. Uh, so you can make your own spruce beer actually very easily, especially if you just wanna buy the spruce essence, you know it's, it's actually got some of the best flavor compared to uh, maybe using a blue spruce, which isn't as good. If you've got access to black spruce, you might wanna make your own, but this is actually gonna work really good, and that's what we're gonna use today. Now that we talked about spruce essence, let's talk about the other ingredients, and, and in fact, let's talk about the recipe that we're gonna be using today. Uh, we could use Amelia Simmons's uh, recipe from 1796. Excellent uh, recipe in the very back of this cookbook. This cookbook is available um, on our website, but today I'm gonna to be using a very, very simple recipe from 1788, very similar uh, time period. This is Philadelphia 1788. Now this one's not called spruce beer, but you'll see here, they call it maple beer. To every four gallons of water while boiling, add a quart of maple molasses. When the liquor is cooled to blood heat, put in as much yeast as is necessary to foment it. I like that, foment it. <laughs> uh, malt or bran may be added to this beer when agreeable. If a tablespoon of the essence of spruce is added to the above quantities of water and molasses, it makes a most delicious and wholesome drink. So this is pretty simple, right? It's only got a very, very few ingredients. We've got water here. We want nice, clear, good, soft water if we can get it. Uh, we need our sugar, which is in this case, maple molasses, or you know it as maple syrup. We need some essence of spruce. We've already created that, or even more likely, we've bought it. it uh, that's the good stuff. It really tastes good. And we need some yeast. We need some ale yeast, or any kind of brewing yeast is going to work. If you don't have anything else and you want to make this right away, you can use bread yeast. But if you're going to be ordering your spruce essence, order some ale yeast at the same time. It's not very expensive. Now, most recipes in the 18th century uh, actually call for just straight up molasses. And what they probably mean is regular cane uh, molasses, uh, dark you know, molasses that's a byproduct of making sugar. Tastes great, but in this, re in this kind of recipe, it really brings too much flavor to it. It overpowers the spruce. We don't want that to happen. So I really recommend this particular recipe that uses maple syrup. If you don't wanna use maple syrup, you can also use cane syrup that's available in the store. That's gonna give you the most spruce flavor. Uh, even this maple might bring in a little bit more flavor than you want, but I think it's a perfect mix, maple and spruce together. So I really recommend this one. Uh, you can try it with the, with the regular uh, molasses. I, just, I think it just way overpowers it though. So let's get started making this recipe. We've got our water. I've already got it warmed up a little bit. We're gonna put this over the fire in this case, and we want to get it heated up. We're gonna be using this two gallons as our uh, particular recipe. Um, and most of the recipes have this same sort of um, ratio of sugar to water. So it's about eight to one. So for two gallons of water, we have a quart 
of maple syrup. I'm just gonna go ahead and pour our quart right in. And then our next ingredient is our essence of spruce. And we're gonna use about, oh, let's say two ounces of spruce essence here. Now this, we're gonna bring this up to a boil. Uh, many of the 18th century recipes would actually have us boil this for a long time. Some of them have the water uh, to be boiled uh, until it's half as much, which is crazy. They did that on purpose. They thought in the 18th century that the effervescence uh, that comes from a brewed beer or other kind of brewing things, they, they thought that those bubbles actually came from the boiling of this wart. Uh, but, in, but we know today that, of course, all that effervescence is because of the yeast. So we know that the only point of really getting this to boil is basically to sterilize the batch here. We want to kill everything off, so we're going to bring this up to a boil, and then immediately, as soon as it's boiling, uh, just for a minute or so, we're actually going to let it cool off. Remember that substitution in the, uh, the, the soldier's rations where it said they either got a gallon of spruce beer or they got molasses as a substitute? They got molasses as a substitute so they could make their own spruce beer. That's the one component that it would be the most difficult to come up with. So that's why the substitute ration for spruce beer is molasses, so the soldiers could make their own. We've got our mixture in our fermenting vessel, and now it's ready for the next step. If this is cooled down to blood temperature and cooler, we wanna be able to put our finger in it and say, oh, no heat there, right? We want it to be below blood temperature. Now we can pitch our yeast, and we've got our ale yeast. This is the kind of yeast that the brewer would take off a batch of beer and he'd use it for the next batch. That's exactly what we're using here. So we've got some yeast, and we're gonna just pour that in maybe about a pint, and that's good for our two gallons. If you're using a modern yeast that comes in a packet, usually those are meant for five gallon batches, so you'd use about a half a batch. And those uh, yeast have, those yeast packets have very particular directions, so follow the directions on the packet for the temperature uh, and exactly how you put it in there, because each one's a little bit different. This is ready, it's going to start fermenting right away, and uh, it will ferment for the next couple of days. But for right now, we're just gonna cover this up. If you're using a modern equipment, you know, you, you'd be using special you know, things that keep the air out. But in the 18th century, they didn't do that. We're just gonna put a nice lid on here, keep the dust out, and it's gonna start percolating away. So this has been working a couple of days now. Let's take a look at it and hey, it looks really good. It's, uh, it's been um, fermenting. There's still a few bubbles coming on this, but it's mostly fermented away. Now we can use it. We could drink it right now, perfectly good. We can also bottle this up and they would have, they had directions for that. So uh, we're just gonna uh, basically ladle this off and put it right into uh, some stoneware bottles. You might use a glass bottle for this and we, we can bottle this for short periods of time. Sometimes they say this will last a while, but I would again recommend this to be used fairly rapidly. But if we bottle it, we can get some effervescence from it. Um, that's uh, another thing to remember that uh, this is still going to ferment a little bit. It's going to pressurize that bottle. And just like the ginger beer, if you have too much sugar and it's still fermenting a lot in the bottle, it might explode. Or it might build up so much pressure that it's hard to uncork and you'll get, you know, it basically all of it comes out instead of, uh, instead of being able to drink it. So um, you don't want to, you want this to bottle up to get a little bit of carbonation, not too much, or it's very, very difficult to, to uncork. Well, we've got a great look to it. It's, uh, it's got a wonderful smell to it, not like pine saw that you might worry about. It's like, oh, it's got spruce, it's got pine in it. It's just not like that at all. Um, I'm really interested to see how this particular batch turned out because each one sort of has its own thing going on. So let's give it a try. There's still a little bit of carbonation. Uh, that's good. It, it hasn't, um, it, I haven't let this carbonate a long time. We've got a, a several different flavors coming in here. We've got certainly the, the spruce and that kind of comes in in the smell. 
but the maple syrup flavor is still there and that is really good so you're mixing this wonderful smooth uh, spray spruce with the uh, maple syrup and a little bit of yeast uh, but not in a bad way at all mm, very refreshing make a great summertime drink boy that, that is a, a very unique but very good uh, flavor if you get a chance this one's this one's one to try out Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm John Townsend. Today we are outside because we're, we are cooking the stinkiest recipe yet, stockfish. Woo! Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So what is stockfish? Stockfish is dried cod. They catch cod, they gut it, and then they put it out to sort of dry out, freeze dry it almost, uh, on these big racks in Norway. So you can imagine uh, they have all these thousands and thousands of cod that are drying out in the cold weather. It takes months uh, for these things to dry out completely. Stockfish is a very old uh, type of food preservation technique. They've, they've been doing this for over a thousand years. Uh, stockfish shows up in English literature. Um, Shakespeare talks about stockfish. There are regulations and, and laws about stockfish early on. You'll also see some references to stockfish in the 18th century. At one point, we know that it wasn't popular with general people because they actually were trying to encourage the importation of stockfish and stockfish recipes. To help us understand how to use stockfish in a recipe, there's a fascinating entry in Nicholas Cresswell's journal. Nicholas Cresswell was a young man going from England to North America to seek his fortune. And he's on board ship here in 1774. He says, dined on stockfish and potatoes. This fish is cured in the frost without salt. Before it is boiled, they beat it with iron hammers against the anchor stock to soften it. A general dish on Fridays and is reckoned a great delicacy, but to me it is none, for I hate the smell of it. Poor Nicholas Cresswell. Uh, but we find out here that they, they take this stockfish, which you can imagine, how do you cook this into food, and they beat it with hammers to soften it up, and then they boil it. So I was checking a bunch of different um, references, cooking references in the 18th century with stockfish, and almost every single reference that talks about cooking stockfish mentions the idea of beating it with hammers. Now, modern day cooking with stockfish, they don't beat it with hammers, but that's what we're gonna do. Let's start prepping our fish by beating it with a hammer. So what we're doing is softening this fish up. If we don't soften it up with a hammer, it will take three or four days of soaking to make this soft enough to actually do something with it. Uh, if we beat it with the hammer, it will take much less time. We might only need to soak it for half a day or just a few hours, or maybe if it's in small enough pieces, we can just toss it right into the boiling water and it'll cook with the potatoes. So let's make a fish stew just like the one that Nicholas Cresswell uh, tried to eat but couldn't eat. Uh, here's our fish. We've already got this beat with our hammer. So it's softened up. The pieces are kind of broken up a little bit. Now, the trick here with this fish is we, we've got skin on it. Um, we've still got bones inside here, cartilage pieces, all kinds of uh, things we don't want to eat necessarily. And while we could toss this in or try to take out bits of it, it's really hard to separate the bones from the flesh unless we just totally pulverize this thing so that the bones broke down too. Sort of like making fish powder. We could do that and then toss it in here. What the, a better way to do it, if we still wanna have nice pieces of fish that we can tell our fish, is we want this to soak. Um, now, I, we don't need to soak a whole four days like we might need to do it if we hadn't pounded it, but this one I pounded last night and then it's been soaking overnight and you can see that it's really opened up here and we've got some nice pieces of flesh. So, so let's open this up and try to get out the bones 
and uh, we'll toss it into some nice boiling water and get this cooking up. So we're just going to look through here and uh, find any kind of bones. There really doesn't seem to be a lot that's, that's really popping out. You can definitely feel sometimes the, uh, the backbone and that you want to get those pieces out of there because that's, that's never going to soften up. But some of these little bones are very soft. I don't think they're going to cause us um, a problem after this gets cooked. So that looks really good. One of the most fascinating things when you soak this stockfish is to watch how much it expands. It, it uh, absorbs water and changes its size to three or four times as thick. It's just amazing to see what happens when this soaks up water. Now that our fish is boiling up, let's take some potatoes and I'm just going to cube them up and we can slide them right in there to boil along with our fish. Our fish and our potatoes are boiling up and hey, no naval recipe is complete without some ship's biscuits. Ship's biscuits, how do you preserve bread for months at a time? Well, you make ship's biscuits and they're a very, very dense bread that's baked three and four times. Very hard very <laughs> breakable and uh, we can break up our ship's biscuits into some little tiny pieces and throw it into our stew to fill it up, um, get it thicker. It really adds some wonderful flavor too. So I'm gonna pound up some ship's biscuits so we can put it in to our stew. I've added some salt and pepper and we're going to let this boil until those potatoes feel nice and soft, probably about a half an hour. Hopefully it'll be done about then. Here's our stew and it actually looks pretty good. And amazingly enough, it does not smell bad at all. So maybe Nicholas Cresswell, he was, he was just, uh, he got to smell it before it was cooked. So maybe that was the problem, but once it's cooked, it doesn't smell bad at all. So the question is, is what does it taste like? Let's get a nice big piece of fish here. Hey. That is surprisingly good. Very nice. Mm. The potatoes have kind of grabbed a little bit of that fish flavor, so they taste good. The ship's biscuit in something like this is perfect. If you if you want to have a little bite left in it, have a, almost like a little piece of beef. You uh, put it in late so that it doesn't break down too much. If you want it to really sort of um, fill up and thicken the stew. You want to put it in early, pound it up nice and, and fine. Either way, it's just so very good. If you really want to, you know, put this right over the top, just a touch of nutmeg would probably make this perfect. But as it is, it is wonderful. Boy, I am so surprised. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and I'm excited about today's episode. We'll be doing a Caribbean-inspired recipe right in the 18th century, Pepper Pot. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. This recipe comes from the lady's assistant, Charlotte Mason, 1777. This is an English cookbook, uh, but it has this obviously Caribbean inspired pepper pot recipe. Uh, to make pepper pot, to, uh, <laughs> to three quarts of water, put in a small cabbage, two large handfuls of spinach, a head of lettuce, two or three onions, a little thyme, cut them very small and let them stew um, let them stew with two pounds of mutton till they are quite tender. Boil with them some little dumplings made of flour and water and a piece of pork, a little salted. A half an hour before it's taken up, put in a lobster or a crab picked 
very small and clean from the shell with a little salt and cayenne pepper. So this pepper pot is, is really a take on uh, an 18th century pepper pot made in the West Indies and then sort of translated into the English context. You can imagine that Charlotte Mason, the author of this particular cookbook, she, she didn't go to the West Indies and watch pepper pot being made and she probably never ate a West Indian pepper pot but someone came from the West Indies and explained this dish and maybe made it so that she had a chance to uh, sort of interpret it. So we have an interpretation, an 18th century interpretation of an 18th century pepper pot. Probably nothing like a pepper pot is made today, but we're gonna make this recipe. We are gonna tweak it a little bit. It seems like she's very light on the pepper of the pepper pot. So we'll play with that a little bit. First off though, we've got a lot of greens here. I've got some spinach. We've got a cabbage that we're gonna cut up a little bit. We've got um, collard greens and a little bit of lettuce. We're gonna chop those up nice and small and get them going in our pot right away. Let's add two onions diced up nice and fine to add into our greens. So the meat portion of this that we're going to put in today is pork. It's fresh pork. The recipe called for mutton. It was probably an inexpensive cut uh, for the time period. She also calls for a little bit of salt pork. Um, we, we've, got a, we've got an opportunity here to put in whatever we please here. You could put in some beef, like stew beef, something uh, similar to that. Right here, I've got some pork already diced up into nice smaller pieces. That looks good, it's boiling up. We might leave that boil for half an hour or so, um, but right now we're gonna work on our hard dumplings. That's the next part of this recipe. She doesn't say exactly when to toss these in, so we're gonna make them up right now. We'll probably let that boil for an hour, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll toss these in and let them cook for a little bit. But let's make them up now. Uh, super simple, I've got flour here, and I'm just gonna toss in a good bit of flour. I don't know, maybe I have 12 ounces of flour. I'm gonna add just a, just a touch of salt to that. That looks good. And now um, water, and I'm gonna make this up into a hard paste. It's just flour, salt, water, add enough. Okay, it's a nice stiff paste. That's what we're looking for. We're just gonna tear it off into say walnut sized uh, little balls. Roll those up like that. There are hard dumplings, so we're gonna make sure they're all sealed up. Sometimes they don't have quite, we wanna have a consistency so it all locks together and doesn't, uh, doesn't wanna fall apart at all, right? That's, that's our dumpling. These are so simple and they show up in a lot of these kinds of soups and stews. If you want some other kind of filler in there, really, really common. This looks really good. It's been slow boiling about an hour, hour and a half. The meat is wonderful and tender. Um, the other things haven't broken down too much, so I don't want to let it cook too long. Next up in the recipe, it says a half hour before serving or half hour before you take it up, you're supposed to put in either some lobster or some crab meat. And it says that it should be all picked, you know, fine. We don't want any shell, we don't want any big chunks. This should be uh, a fine, uh, fine crab meat here and remember in the time period that lobster and crab were probably fairly inexpensive meats here so this isn't necessarily a super fancy way to fix it up at least in the 18th century it might be today so let me put the crab meat in and now we get to the namesake of a pepper pot let's talk about the pepper this isn't black pepper or white pepper that's being used in this. It's cayenne pepper, sometimes called guinea pepper because it came from the Guinea coast of South America. That's what we're gonna put into this. We've got a little bit of salt as it calls for, and then it says cayenne pepper. Does it mean a little bit of cayenne pepper or does it mean a lot? Well, that's up to you, isn't it?
let me tell you, this smells great. And uh, I don't know if I have any, anything quite like this. Can't wait to try this out. Lots of greens in here, lots of greens. Um, and it's got pork and it's got crab meat and it's got the dumplings. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. Let me find a little bit of the crab meat. Mmm. Yes. Yes. And I think I put in just the right amount of cayenne. Definitely a pepper pot, not just a, you know, a stew. We've got more things to try out. The greens. We want some other textures in there. We have the dumpling. <clears throat> a little bit of pork. This, this is great. It may not be exactly like a pepper pot that you know, but it is so good. This really, really interesting 18th century English interpretation of a pepper pot. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend, and we're doing a very special episode today. Uh, normally, I, I cook a, a, a larger kind of a dish, and we have a recipe. And the other day, we had a, a big uh, episode in here, the finish-up episode for the cabin, where we made a meal with multiple things. But today, it's just you and me, and I'm going to cook my favorite sort of comfort food from the 18th century. Such a simple and wonderful dish. It's called toasted cheese uh, from John Knott's cookbook in 1723. Later on, it's called a Welsh rabbit. Just a fun recipe and so easy, so, so wonderful. But I really kind of wanted to talk about uh, the spot here today. We've done cooking episodes from um, the outdoors, out in the woods. Um, we've got an open face shelter. Some of those cooking episodes we've done uh, we're from the, the uh, open face shelter. That's a wonderful spot to cook from. We cook in the German kitchen. That's um, a set that's based upon an 18th century kitchen um, from Germany. There's a wonderful example at uh, the Frontier Culture Museum down in Virginia. We've also done it from historic sites like Mount Vernon and Connor Prairie and Gunston Hall, all these wonderful historic sites. But I wanted a, a spot to cook and a, a place to cook that was just exactly like what they would have had in the 18th century, uh, especially folks out here in the frontier. And so that was one of the reasons why we built this, uh, this whole cabin, so that we could, we could do more of the feeling of cooking in the 18th century than just the recipe itself, right? Uh, I, I, uh, I think there's something really, really special about getting history um, not from a book, and that's great, but feeling history in a totally different way. And this cabin, the building the cabin, being out here, once it was done, I've, I've spent some time out here um, just up around the fire, and then cooking in it um, is an experience that's just completely different than anything you would get in a book and very, very fulfilling in a new kind of way. So if you watched the last episode where we were finishing up the cabin, uh, we finished it as the snow was coming down. This is not something, most of this cabin is either cut logs or mud. And you can't work with mud when it's cold out, when it's freezing. And so we truly finished it up just in time. And it made me really appreciate and understand that idea uh, of people, especially in the frontier, they have to get in and out of the weather when the winter comes and you only have just so much time to do it. It's got to be done. You have to go as fast as possible if the weather is coming, which it was in this case. Truly, truly a new respect for how much they had to go through to just just survive and how wonderful it is to come in from out of the weather 
You get around this hearth, and this hearth is so warm. It's so hot. You have to step back from it. Uh, this, it, it, is, it is something to experience. It truly is. John Knott's recipe isn't the most simple recipe for Welsh rabbit, but I, but I really enjoy it. Uh, he calls for Cheshire cheese, a fat Cheshire cheese. So um, this Cheshire cheese is very creamy. It's, uh, we don't have anything quite like it here uh, in North America that I've found yet. Uh, also, we've probably, you can kind of use equal measures. Uh, we've got the Cheshire cheese. We're going to add in the, to the Cheshire cheese, we've got butter that's uh, nice and cold and I've chopped it up fine. Uh, we've also got breadcrumbs, so white, um, like he calls for the crumb of a penny loaf, which is a small loaf of bread. And the last ingredient he calls for an egg yolk. And in John Knott's recipe, he doesn't specify the egg yolk. This one's hard boiled as some of the later recipes specifically call for. So I went ahead and have, we've got a boiled egg yolk. We're gonna put all these ingredients together in a bowl, or he calls for a mortar, and to mash them all up so they're all consistent spread throughout. And then we take that spread and we put it on top of our pre-toasted bread. And that we've, we toasted it here by the fire. And let me tell you, there's something really special about bread that's toasted over an open fire. Now this mixture comes up a little bit dry when it's cold like this, so I'm gonna put it over the fire just enough to melt it and bring it together. Then we take our spread, we put it on top of our toasts, and then we need to reheat this to melt that mixture down into our toast. Oh, it's so good. And for that, we're going to use a salamander, which is a red hot hunk of iron. We've heated that up in the fire, red hot. We pass that slowly over our cheese. It's gonna melt that down into it, Then it's done. We need to eat it while it's hot. I love these. Um, it's got such a wonderful smell, especially on a cold day like today, still warm. Since it's just you and me, uh, we're just going to scrape a little bit of nutmeg on top, top to give it just, just that over the top aroma note. Let's find out how it turned out this time. This is fabulous. On a cold day, we're out here in the cabin by the open fire. The wonderful cheese flavor comes through, so rich. On this nice warm brown bread, already toasted. It is fabulous. I love this. If, this, if I could eat nothing else, I would eat this all day long. I love this toasted cheese or this Welsh rabbit as they as they call it later on. It's really special to come out into the cabin, cook this special dish, uh, take some time, really kind of reflect on this whole project because it has been huge. This project has taken so much time and effort and um, it's worth it. It's just just this just this time alone. It's worth it to spend time out here. Uh, it's worth it to cook in this hearth, which is a completely different experience. I know this has been a different episode. It's, it's, a, it's a personal one. It's just you and me here in the cabin. And I want to thank you for coming along with us, you know, on this adventure, whether it's a, the adventure of, the, you know, the experience of building the cabin or the experience of, of trying out these foods, tasting these foods. You know, kind of not just looking at history from a long way away, but getting right in there and trying it out. It's something that just can't be explained. You just have to, you just have to do it. You have to be there. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Normally, when we think about stews, we think uh, a one-pot, um, inexpensive meal for poor people, right? But today, we'll be looking at a fancy beef stew. Thanks for coming along as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So this recipe comes from the lady's assistant, Charlotte Mason, 1777. And her title for this uh, receipt is to stew beef gobbets. And a gobbet means a chunk of meat uh, big enough that you can eat. So she actually says the size of a chicken's egg. Now, this recipe book is not a uh, poor person's food. This is actually fairly well-to-do food. So this is a beef stew 
for middling or maybe even upper class table. So let's get started on this. It's really simple. Let's take a cut of beef here. This is like a chuck eye roast, something simple. She says, not too fat, not too lean. We're gonna cut this into our gobbet size pieces. We're just gonna cut this into basically large squares about the size of a small chicken's egg. And uh, then we're gonna toss these into our pot. I'm gonna, I've got our stew pot um, already heated up over the fire here. We're just gonna toss these in and start getting them browned up. And this, this browning um, really brings out some of those wonderful beef flavors. This particular recipe doesn't mention this. Other 18th century recipes do mention this step. Um, she probably just left that out. Um, sometimes when they too talk about boiling beef, they say if it's fresh beef, you put this into boiling water. If it's salt beef, you put it into cold water and bring it up to a boil. Here, we're just gonna brown it. And now that it's all nice and browned, we can uh, pour the water in on top of this. We wanna get oh, enough water to cover these up maybe twice over. And we're gonna let this stew for, uh, let's say about a half an hour, 45 minutes. Uh, it depends on how big your pot is, but, but we wanna get this meat really started cooking and then we'll do some other steps. While our meat is stewing over here, we need to work on the next part of this recipe. Uh, we've got some root vegetables and other vegetables we're gonna put in here. Uh, we've got carrots that we're gonna cut up, uh, some turnip type things. We could have any kind of root vegetable. You could have uh, potatoes, turnips are particularly mentioned. And we've got celery. Along with that, we've got a crust of bread that we're gonna throw in. It can be a nice stale piece uh, if you've got it. If you don't, well, you're gonna, you're gonna throw in a crust of a crust of bread, not bread crust or bread crumbs, but a whole crust. Along with these vegetables and the bread, we've got spices. Of course, we've got salt we're gonna put in. Uh, we've got peppercorns, cloves, and mace. Now, all of these are in their whole form. We're actually gonna put these little pieces inside of a piece of muslin or cheesecloth and tie that up so that they don't get lost in our stew. So um, when it gets done, we'll pull those out. And we've got a bundle of sweet herbs. Also, same deal. We're going to tie these up so that we can take them out later on in our dish so that they don't crumbly bits. The recipe calls for stewing this meat and water here for about an hour. It's time to put in our vegetables and our spices and our herbs. Uh, let's go ahead and put in the bread crust. Once these are all in there, we can give it a quick stir and then we put the lid on. This is supposed to be kept tight so that it kind of holds in all those flavors. While our stew is finishing up, we just set it off, off on the fire. It's pretty much cooked already. Uh, just before serving, we need to do our last little kind of fancy step and that is to fry some toasts in butter. Here is our fancy stew. Fancy because, you know, we've got some special bread served with it, fried. It also had extra herbs and spices in it to uh, bring some of those flavors out. Let's find out how it turns out. Let me get a little bit of bread there with it. Some of the meat. Mm. Meat is done perfectly. It's not too fall aparty, but it will fall apart. Our, um, our vegetables, easy to eat, but still have held together. Just perfect timing on this. Mm. Oh, yeah. And even those sweet herbs and the spices, really coming through on this one. Excellent. I mean, it smelled really good just coming out of the pot. It looks good as a serve, you know, something that's served in a nice bowl and everything. So I can definitely see how these stewed gobbets could really turn out uh, looking very nice on a fancy table. So most folks in the 18th century are going to have a kitchen, obviously, but most of, especially these poor farmers in the back country, they don't have a brick uh, oven like you might find in the city and of course there isn't a local baker to just go and buy bread which is what you would do if you lived in the city 
And even later on in, say, the early 19th century, bake kettles get to be very popular. But in 1750, bake kettles really aren't around. So how are you going to bake your bread if you are a farmer out on the frontier? Well, you're going to use a large cast iron pot. That's what we'll be using to bake today. But first, let's make up our recipe. we got to get our dough ready so we have something to bake. So today's bread is a Ryan Indian bread, which is the probably the most common staple bread in the 18th century for the colonies. It's, it's the least expensive and easy to get a hold of. Bread in the 18th century, basic bread is so simple. It's just made with flour, salt, yeast, and water. So today for the flour, we've got uh, what they would call Indian meal or Indian corn meal. And you would maybe know it better as maize if you're in other parts of the world. This is uh, a very simple ground up meal. And then we've got rye uh, flour also. We're gonna mix these guys 50-50. These would be inexpensive and readily available. Other parts of the world, other flours would be used here. These are the ones that are simple. We've also got, of course, a little bit of salt and that makes um, bread worth eating sometimes. If you don't have salt, you don't really have bread. We've also got something uh, that is yeast. And this one, we're not using yeast yeast. In the 18th century, nice breads, especially city breads, they would be using barm, which is yeast that they would get from the brewer. This kind of bread really needs something that's a lot closer to sourdough. And what I've got here is actually a dried up, whoop, I broke it, a dried up uh, piece of old dough and this is a, a, a what's called a leaven technique or the old dough technique where we would use dough from a previous batch if we baked uh, bread in the last couple of days or in the last week our dough might be wet we'd have this kind of old lumpy hunk of dough from the last batch that we didn't bake this is several years old this is actually a batch from uh, connor prairie that we got a couple of years ago we'll revive this yeast and use it today so to get our yeast ready to use in this recipe, we have to soak these in nice warm water. You'll want uh, a couple of chunks. We're gonna soak this in warm water to get it activated. That way, that way it's really easy to mix in. And the last ingredient, of course, is nice clean water. The best bread is made with the best water, so we, you wanna have very, very nice clean water. Let's get mixing this up. You don't need to overwork this dough. Uh, not a lot of kneading. We just need to get it into shape. And again, this is pretty moist, pretty moist. So as soon as we got a good shape on it, this one could even be just slightly moister. But we're going to set this aside right here in our, uh, our vessel that will let this rise up. And we want something, something that uh, kind of holds the heat in. We want to set this someplace warm. We're going to let this rise at least four hours, maybe eight hours overnight someplace warm it won't get big this isn't going to get really big it will start to crack the surface that's when we know that it's growing a little bit let's put this away someplace warm so here is a classic cast iron pot of the 18th century probably about a five gallon pot and of course they would use something like this for cooking they would also use it for different sorts of washing. So it's a, a very versatile pot. And not only can you use it for cooking, not only for washing, but we can use it for baking too. And there's a wonderful um, recipe or article in uh, William Ellis's 1750 um, Housewife's Family Companion. And he talks about uh, cottagers in sort of, um, or lower class farmers in England. And he talks about them using their cast iron pots for baking. So first, what we're gonna do is heat up our hearth. We've got a, a hearth underneath this, some bricks, and we're gonna heat that up nice and hot. And then we'll put our bread on that, turn our pot over the top of it, bake a, put a big fire over the top of it, and bake it just like that. So I'm gonna get working on the fire while our dough is getting ready. Well, this one is ready to go. It's risen. You can see the cracks in it. So it started to grow a little bit. And I've gone ahead and put a slice over the top to control some of that cracking. Let's set this aside for just a second. Now our fire pit should be ready and hot enough. Let me clear away these coals and get this hearth ready. Ready? 
This hearth is really nice and hot. This is gonna be perfect. Let's get the bread on this. There's our pot on top. I've preheated this a little bit, so it's, it's not cold uh, to start off with. And now we look at um, William Ellis's directions on this, and he says to cover it with wet straw or damp straw, and then put some ashes on top of it, and then add a little coals. What he's looking for is a slow heat for this, not a rapid giant bonfire. We don't wanna burn this to a crisp, but we're gonna have a nice slow fire going on it. I don't have a lot of wet straw. I do have some cut uh, sort of hay that's, that's not good, and I've got sticks and leaves. So we're gonna, we're gonna build a small fire, a slow fire over the top of this and bake it for mm, 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on how long it takes and how hot it seems. The original recipe for a big loaf was three to four hours. This smells so good. This is right out of, uh, right out of the oven, as it were, and uh, I, I shouldn't cut into this. This should set up. We should let this set for a half hour, 20 minutes, an hour, who knows how long, for the crumb to set up so it won't be gooey. I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna cut into it right now because I can't wait. I'm just gonna take a little slice off the side here. There we are. It's still steaming. It's steaming hot. Let me try it without butter. Mm. This is great. I cut into it way too early. Don't tell anybody. This is super. This is amazing. No oven, no nothing. Cooked just like the poor farmer would. I mean, if he was really hungry, he would have cut into it too. This is just like stepping into a cabin in 1750 and taking bread right off the table. It's amazing i love living history trying it out it's amazing welcome to 18th century cooking i'm john townsend your host and today we'll be taking a step back we're going to be going back and revisiting one of our favorite recipes it's called white pot thanks for coming along with us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century So it's been almost seven years to the day when we did our original White Pot episode, and, and it was really sort of groundbreaking at the time. One of our first uh, baked puddings, and it was so good that, um, you know, throughout the years when people have asked us, uh, what was your favorite recipe? It's one of those ones that always floats to the top. We remember it, and in fact, we miss it. We want to go back and make it again. That's what we're going to do today. And this particular version of it, I'm, I'm coming uh, from uh, the Housewife's Family Companion. This is uh, William Ellis, about 1750. Great cookbook. There's a couple of versions of White Pot in here. And of course, this recipe shows up in many, many uh, cookbooks in the 18th century because it is just that good. So let's talk about our ingredients. Uh, this one is definitely a little different than the first one we did. Uh, this is probably a little simpler, maybe a little less expensive. We've got a bread. You're gonna need some uh, white bread for our crust or our crumb is actually what we need on the inside. We'll take off the crust. Uh, our other main ingredient is milk. And this is, they call for something like new milk. So whole milk will work in this case. Uh, we've got eggs, that's our other um, major ingredient here. We also will use some fruits. So in the original one, we used, um, I think, dates. This has got currants and raisins. Very, very typical for one of these puddings. Uh, we're going to need a little bit of sugar. And we've got butter here. And for our spicing, we'll use uh, some nutmeg. And uh, some of these recipes also, also call for allspice, for, let's say, a, a less expensive version. Let's start off with our eggs. We are going to use two whole eggs and two egg yolks. Now let's uh, get this whisked up. Now that our eggs are whisked up, let's add in some milk here. Now the original recipe that we did seven years ago used a lot of cream. 
and butter. Instead, this one just uses milk, so it is maybe not less, not as expensive. Okay, so there's our milk, and let's add in some some sugar here. Uh, I'm using a torbinado sugar, so it's it's still got some molasses in it because we want a little bit of that molasses flavor. Not a lot. We wouldn't, wouldn't want to use molasses, but there's a good a goodly amount of sugar. Get that stirred in. Even at this phase, we're just going to go ahead and get some nutmeg into this. If we were using a, a less expensive one, we would just use our allspice. Now let's set this part aside and let's work on the bread. That's really the next step. We need some nice thin slices of our bread. And while we could use a household loaf, brown bread, um, really we should be using a white bread in this if, if we've got it available. Go ahead and remove the crust. We just need the crumb out of this. So we can just cut, to cut our crust away. This is a, a great opportunity if you've got leftover uh, bread that's stale, isn't, uh, you know, isn't um, as good as, as nice fresh bread. Uh, perfect opportunity to use that. So we've got our bread cut up. I've got a nice buttered dish here that we're going to bake this in. And we're going to start putting this together. Now, last time we, we did a lot of buttering of the bread. I don't think we really need to do that. We're just going to cut straight to the chase. Uh, start out with a layer of bread at the bottom. And just kind of fill this in. Very nice. We're going to start sprinkling in. Um, we can kind of mix these raisins and currants up. So they're kind of half and half. Oh yeah, one last ingredient. I almost forgot it. I, I thought this was kind of fun. Uh, this one has some lemon zest in it. So I'll put most of this lemon zest just in our liquid and I'll just do a sprinkling here on this first layer. The rest of it goes in there. Uh, now that we have our first layer of bread and uh, fruit in there, let's just pour in enough of our mixture to just sort of bring it right up over the top of the bread. Looks good. And another layer of bread. We can mush it down a little bit. Just You don't want to pack it tight, but you want to uh, get it to soak up everything that's in there. You definitely want to keep stirring this mixture as you pour it in or else all the sugar will fall to the bottom. We don't want that to happen. We want that to be spread evenly throughout. We've got just a little bit of bread left. We don't want to get this too high because it's going to grow in the oven. Uh, so it'll puff up. Make sure to leave a little bit of room and be mindful it might boil over a little bit in your oven. So uh, protect your oven in that case. Okay, this is good. We've got this all sort of filled up with a little bit of room at the top. The last thing going in here is butter. We're going to go ahead and just put butter on the top of this in a couple of places. Nice couple of just big chunks of butter. There we go. That looks really good. Just like that, it's going to go into the oven and we're going to bake this um, depending on the size of your uh, white pot. Mm, probably 30 to 45 minutes. So let's get this one in the oven. If you're using a modern oven, 350 degrees or so. We're going to go ahead and make a special pudding sauce for this one. And this is sort of pudding sauce royale. Uh, we've got some butter here. Um, let's say a quarter of a cup of butter. And then we're going to add to that sugar, quarter of a cup of sugar, and then some brandy and about an equal amount. And then maybe just a little bit of cream in here just to thicken it up a touch. And then warm this all up over the fire. Now it isn't going to stay as a sauce. we got to keep stirring it. But... That's what we're going to put over the top of this. I'm going to add a little bit of, uh, of the special sauce to this one. Uh, can't go wrong with that special sauce. And let's try this out. Now I know why. I always call this the best one. Um, I, if you get a chance to try it out, you will enjoy this. It's got some wonderful flavors. It's got this great texture, that cooked bread. We've got raisins. We've got some nutmeg in there. You know, we got to have that. Um, the, the pudding sauce, really, that's a super extra topper. You don't need that. It's excellent without it. 
Um, just wonderful flavors. You can adjust the sweetness. Tremendous. Remember, this one's from the William Hellis um, Housewife's Family Companion. Just a tremendous book with a lot of uh, poor people food, the why. It's not just a cookbook. It's, it's more of a farm, a homesteading kind of book from the English uh, countryside, 1750. Excellent, excellent book. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today we'll be cooking something that's very common today, but with a special 18th century twist, fried potatoes. Thank you for coming along as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. So the recipe today is from the English Art of Cookery, Richard Briggs, 1788. I, you know, I read through tons of cookbooks, looking at thousands of recipes, and um, some recipes I just skip right over because they, uh, they're, they're probably too simplistic or too complicated. And this one I've probably skipped over many times. I thought, fried potatoes. How tough can that be? It's just called to fry potatoes. But then I read it through and said, well, wait a minute, this has got a wonderful twist. So let's get started on this recipe. So first step is let's peel some potatoes, as many pa uh, potatoes as we need. Now we need to slice our potatoes. The directions are specifically um, to the size of a crown piece, which is this is similar to uh, today's silver dollar. So you want to have silver dollar size little pieces of sliced potato. Now that we've got these sliced up, uh, these get breaded. So this is a, definitely different than the way I would I would normally fry potatoes. I'd just just toss them wholesale into the uh, into the pan, right? But these get individually breaded in plain flour. That's it. Now that these are all breaded, let's take them over to the fire. Okay, here they are. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this. Um, so this is nothing like uh, fried potatoes like I'm used to. Uh, you know, lots of fried potatoes in a pan, you know, salt. Um, because this, the, this, the super twist with this is this. Over the top of this uh, goes a pudding sauce, basically. It's sack, it's sugar, it's butter in equal quantities and poured over the top. There, that's in the recipe, or you could just do it with just butter, right? But I wanted to do this one for the fun of it. And of breaded and fried individually, browned on both sides, they're a lot more like giant thick potato chips than they are fried potatoes like we might be used to. Uh, and then we pour pudding sauce over the top? This has got to be incredible! So let's find out. Wow, what is this? I'm not even sure how I would describe this. A dessert potato chip? They're not fried enough to be super crispy. They're browned on both sides. So they're almost like little pancakes, maybe. I could eat these all day. They're incredible. I have no I, I have I have no connection. I have no way of connecting this to a modern food that we eat today. Not fried potatoes in the least. Hmm. Amazing flavors. And pudding sauce goes well on just about anything. So, uh, wow, this, I, I'm so glad that I stopped in the cookbook and tried this one out. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today we'll be using an ingredient we have never used before on the channel, artichokes. Thanks for joining us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. 
Artichokes show up in a lot of different recipe books, uh, English recipe books from the 18th century. Um, a lot of these recipes are very, very similar. This one's mostly based on uh, the recipe here in Hannah Glass's cookbook, uh, The Art of Cookery. This one really is sort of the stable. If you're only going to get one 18th century cookbook, this is probably the one to get. Um, this recipe is pretty simple. Uh, except it really doesn't tell you what to do with the artichokes. So that's that's where we're going to start. Let me read to you her recipe. This one's really easy in the recipe, at least. Not necessarily in the doing. To fry artichokes. First, blanch them in water. Then flour them. Fry them in fresh butter. Lay them in your dish. Pour melted butter over them. Or you may put in a little red wine into the butter and season with nutmeg, pepper, and salt. So, right. Super, super simple. But it's not that simple because uh, what really happens is, what the hard part is what happens before you do anything in this recipe. You can't just take this artichoke and do exactly what she says and turn out with anything very edible because the inside of the artichoke is like a little hairball. It's the choke of the artichoke. We gotta take that out. And these outer leaves, if you try to eat them, it's like, like trying to eat rope. So. Let's prepare these. Let's get these cut down to what we can actually work with. So let's start to prepare these artichokes. We need to get them uh, sort of cut up and get the external uh, layer off of here. Now, before I start cutting this, uh, one of the tricks with artichokes is the fact that at, when you cut them, if you let them set in the open air, they start to turn black and do strange color things. Uh, so to keep them from doing that, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it completely, uh, but we're gonna have a, a bath of water and a lemon. We're gonna squeeze a little lemon juice in there so that that protects them from discoloring too much. So let's squeeze a lemon in there. Let's cut off the very end of the stem. You don't want to cut off all the stem because there's good stuff inside the stem, but we'll cut off uh, the, the last half inch on this one. And let's get rid of these excess leaves that are just easy to get rid of. We can basically cut the very top of this. All the tips of these leaves, some of them have almost like a thorn at the end of them. We want to get rid of uh, the tips of all the leaves. So let's just cut off the, the first inch here. Okay. So you can already see, because I'm using um, a, a non-stainless steel knife, it starts to turn color here. So we get this sort of black color. Just, I'm not going to be able to do too much about that. 18th century knives were carbon steel and carbon steel reacts with the chemicals inside of this. But we can see uh, that we've gotten rid of most of this outside. We can also just sort of cut away this outer, these outer leaves. Let me dunk this to keep it from discoloring. We're trying to get down to these nice yellow leaves. Now let's make sure to get the, the very uh, outer skin off of the stem. So we don't want that, but we do want what's inside the stem. So this sort of uh, fibrous exterior, we're going to take off. So these are all ready. They're all trimmed up. It's time to put them in boiling water. The Hannah Glass recipe says to just blanch them. And blanch them just means put them in the boiling water for a very short period of time. I've got a different recipe book here. This is Richard uh, Briggs in The Art of uh, English Cookery. And this one, it's a little bit later recipe. And he goes into a little bit more explanation about artichokes. And in this one, he says, boil them till they're tender. There's definitely more than just blanching going on with this particular uh, recipe. and. I'm going to go ahead and let these boil for a little bit. I'm not sure how long it takes to get them to be tender. I've never really worked that much with artichokes, especially this kind of recipe before. So I'm going to let these boil for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes. And some recipes I think even call for boiling an hour, hour and a half, not necessarily for frying them, but you know, I think I'm pretty safe in letting them boil for a little bit of time before we cut these up. Uh, the ones I've, eaten before they can be pretty tough so I'm gonna I'm gonna let them get tender 
And this can be uh, some of the fun of interpreting these recipes. You gotta look at a, a bunch of different recipes, figure out what's going on, what can go wrong, and it may take three or four or five tries at a recipe like this before you get it like you really want it. Uh, these are really made as suggestions. They are not complete directions. So you, you learn as you go. Now that these are out of the water, let's go ahead and cut them in half. And they're definitely softer. Once we get them cut in half, we've got this final little part that we have to do. We're gonna cut them in quarters also, but we need to cut the choke out. And let's look at the inside here. Now that we've got this cut in half, we can see this, these, this hairy part uh, in here. Now this may not taste bad, but it's got a texture that we don't like. Sort of like the, the outside might not taste bad, but it's got a texture like rope. Uh, this section's like a little hairball in there, and we're gonna cut this out. But we don't wanna cut too far down into the flesh underneath that, because that's some of the very best part of the artichoke. So we're just gonna very carefully cut all these little, little hair sections out. Now we want these to dry off, so I'm gonna take my quarters. Because we're gonna be frying them, we don't want too much moisture there. I'm gonna take these guys, set them on here, and get them to dry off a little bit. Let's set these aside, and now let's make the flour that we're gonna dredge these in, and then we can start to fry them. Just got some uh, unbleached flour, got some salt and pepper, just gonna add that. Some just black pepper, I like pepper, so we're gonna put a lot of that in there. Final ingredient, I'm gonna put nutmeg in here. Um, I know you think it's a joke, but it's not. Uh, Briggs's recipe definitely puts nutmeg on top of, of these guys, and uh, he puts these spices inside the flour. Some of them put the spices on afterwards. Uh, we're gonna put these spices right here in our flouring, so when we fry it, it, it uh, fries the flavor right in. Our artichokes are ready. They've been fried up nice and brown, which is what the directions called for. I'm not sure how to eat these or what utensil to use, so I think I'm just gonna go ahead and pick them up to try them. And um, I just know from experience that this, this very outside edge probably isn't the best part. So we'll just take a, a chunk out of the middle here. Leave behind those very outside, um, outside leaves. That was a big bite. Mm, really, really good. It kind of reminds me, uh, this time of year, this is the time of year we go out and we hunt morel mushrooms, fry them up just like this. Well, it reminds me of that. They've got a wonderful sweet flavor to them. And there's, uh, we can eat, basically the stem is all good once we've skinned that. And especially this very, this base is some of the very, very best uh, part of it. So good, so good. Mm. Who would have thought? These weird, they're actually related to um, thistles. So who would have guessed that you could go out and fry up these thistles, giant thistle heads in butter? They taste great. If you get a chance to try something like this, you will definitely enjoy it.
Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. We have not done shellfish for a long time on the channel. Today we'll be doing a 17th century shrimp recipe from Martha Washington's cookbook. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. The book we're using today is Martha Washington's Book of Cookery. This is a, a cookbook that was handed down to her, a family cookbook from the 17th century. Now, George and Martha Washington lived on the Potomac River and uh, fishing was one of the big industries all up and down the East Coast. They were catching you know, regular uh, sea fish, uh, saltwater fish. They were also getting lobsters and uh, shellfish of all kinds. I don't know whether or not they harvested shrimp along the East Coast, whether they had access to shrimp uh, right there at, their, at Mount Vernon, but we do know that uh, shrimp was a very common dish for the 17th and 18th century, maybe even uh, one that was fairly inexpensive, at least compared to what we think of as shrimp today. Let me read to you this recipe. It is so simple. To butter shrimps, first take the shrimps after they are boiled and set them on coals till they are very hot. Then melt your butter, beat it very thick, pour it on them when they are served up, and throw on some pepper. Isn't that simple? So let's get started. First step, we need to have boiled shrimp. If yours aren't already boiled, pop them into boiling water, let them boil a few minutes. It doesn't take very long. All we need to do is heat these up in just a little bit of butter. She calls for these to be very hot. If they've just come off the boil for you, then uh, they won't take but a second. If they're already pre-cooked, they're cold, you definitely want to bring them up to hot, but don't let them overcook. Let's get our butter melted. Once our butter's melted, we can take it back up to the table and whisk it up. Pour these into something that's a little easier to whisk. And now, it calls for whisking this until it thickens up. This is just a, such a simple 17th century drawn butter sauce. And it, you know, it's still common today. In the 18th century, later on, this sauce gets a lot more complicated. I think it's really interesting here that in the 17th century, it's just so simple. And it's kind of harkens, you know, forward to what we would do today. So this has thickened up nicely. It's ready to go on the shrimp. Our shrimp looks great and it's nicely cooked, very hot. Uh, the drawn butter sauce, the pepper, this smells great. These are fantastic. Mm. I could eat these all day long. This uh, 17th century shrimp recipe, so good, so simple. Anyone, anyone can do this. This is just wonderful. So before we get started, let me give you a little bit of the behind the scenes about how some of these recipes work. And this one's tricky. This is, this comes from the professed cook. This is 1769. And this particular um, author is actually translating a French cookbook of that same time period. And so uh, we've got kind of two translations that we have to figure out, both the original one from the French to the English, and then what does the English one mean, right? So this one's uh, whipped cream like snow it says make small cakes in the form of pots uh, with a good paste when <laughs> when they are baked take off the top take out as much of the inside as you can without breaking them fill them with a good whipped cream and put the covers on and serve now uh, we had trouble right away when when it says you know make small cakes it doesn't say which cake to make um, you know, there are multiple different kind of recipes for cakes, as it were, in this recipe book. Then it says, in the form of 
It, it's the word is uh, like the French for the, the start for pastry, so pot. Um, and I don't know how you even make that into a plural and say it properly. So we don't, and, and with a good paste. So we don't, aren't sure what we're gonna make this cake out of, but really this recipe is all about the form. What they're making here is a cream puff. You make a, a puff, uh, sort of a, a pastry cake, and then you take off the top and you put the cream inside and then you put the top back on. So it really doesn't tell you how to make the cream or the cake. So we have to go digging here in our other recipe books for that. Uh, if we go, if we back up in this recipe book a few 20 pages or so, we find royal paste. That's what we're going to use in, in uh, today's recipe. There are multiple other ones here. I've tried a couple. They didn't work very well at all, but we found the perfect one here about 20 pages back. And then for the whipped cream part, the cream that goes in the center, we could do a number of different kinds of creams. But actually, I've picked one out of Eliza Smith's Complete Housewife Cookbook. Um, that one is actually the, the cream for a whipped syllabub. That one is nice and easy, very tasty. So that's the, the cream that we're going to put in here. Although, boy, we could do all kinds of great things for the inside of this one. This is really one of the best parts of this. Each time it's like you have to be a detective to put together the different components and come up with what they probably were making. Let's get started on this one. Here is royal paste. This is from the professed cook. Boil half a pint of water a moment. And with a little sugar, a quarter of a pound of butter, a little fine rasped lemon peel, a little salt, put flour to it, a little and a little to mix it well and pretty thick. Turn it and stir it continually on the fire until it quits the pan. Take it off and while it is warm, put eggs to it one by one. Mix it well put <laughs> and put eggs until it comes to the consistency of paste. And then he names some other paste, which I have no idea what its consistency would be. And, and it sticks to the fingers. Well, if you're familiar with uh, similar, this is this uh, kind of uh, paste or batter or dough you would call it, is called shoe. And it's, uh, it's one that we start, we have to make it over the fire. So let's get our pan on the fire. We'll start making up this royal paste. So in the pan here, we've got boiling uh, about a cup of water. It's not really not very much water at all. To that, we're gonna add our sugar, about oh, a tablespoon of sugar. Now we put in some lemon zest. That's the one thing that's a little bit different about this shoe or this royal paste than some pastes that are going to be very similar to that. Now it's time to add butter. And we've got about four ounces of butter that we're gonna put in. And now just a little bit of salt. We're gonna make sure this comes right back up to heat. Now comes the trickier part. Uh, we're gonna start adding our flour. So we're adding this flour and you just need to keep stirring it. And as soon as it starts to break from the way or from the sides, you can see that it's time to take it off the fire. We're off the fire. It's cooled down a little bit, but it's still warm. The directions say to add our eggs in one at a time while stirring. So, and it doesn't say how many eggs. It says uh, to what consistency it's supposed to get. And this can be a little, strange and sloppy, but we're just gonna keep mixing until that gets completely mixed in. There we go, that third one should probably do it. Well, the texture looks uh, nice, smooth, silky. Hopefully that's the right texture that they're trying to shoot for in the recipe. Of course, you know, it says to, it sticks to your fingers. Well, that it does. So let's, uh, let's put some, some uh, blobs of this on our cooking sheet.
I'm gonna put these in the oven, a kind of semi-quick oven at, uh, for about 30 minutes or so in a modern oven. Oh, 375, I think I would shoot for on these. Let's get them in the oven. So our pastry is in the oven. It's time to work on our whipped cream component of this recipe. This is from The Complete Housewife. To make whipped syllabubs, take a quart of cream, not too thick, a pint of sack, the juice of two lemons, sweeten it to your palate, put it into a broad earthen pan, and with a whisk, whip it as the froth rises, take it off with a spoon. That's what we're going to do. We're gonna half this recipe because we don't need a giant mountain of this stuff, but let's get started with our cream. So first off, we've got about a pint of cream. I'm gonna add that into our bowl and it is kind of thick, but I'm sure it's not gonna cause us that much trouble. Uh, sugar, I've got some sugar here already ground up with a mortar, so it's nice and fine. That, that should be about right. The juice of a lemon got here and also, we've got some sherry. In the recipe, it calls for sack. We don't necessarily call it the same thing today. Sack, sherry, fairly similar. We'll add that in here and we'll get to whisking to it. And um, it calls for about a cup of this uh, sack. And I'm a little concerned about that that might be too much. So I've cut back on that just a hair. If you want to make a non-alcoholic version, um, try sparkling. Uh, a sparkling cider or a sparkling wine, non-alcoholic version. Uh, that should work. This is actually looking pretty good. I, I could keep going with this whipping and, and get it to a different consistency, but I, I think this is gonna work just fine for these. Um, this is definitely something that we will wanna serve right away. If you want something that can sit around on the shelf for a little bit, I would definitely go with one of the other recipes that uses egg whites and makes a, a much stiffer whipped cream. But since we're gonna serve these right away, this is gonna work out great. These look great. They're out of the oven, they've cooled off. It's time to take the tops off, see if there's any, uh, if there's a hole in the middle that we can, we can put our uh, cream into. This dough kind of leaves itself open for that. We can take a little bit out of the center to make room for the cream puff, but we do want to make sure not to damage the uh, exterior as it calls for in the directions. Now let's spoon in our whipped cream, just like snow, right? Well, here they are. You know what? Looks like cream puffs to me. Yep, <laughs> that's what they are, even though the, uh, the recipe book didn't call them that. Obviously, by the time we get done with them, they're pretty recognizable as that. At least that's what we know them here uh, in the United States. Let's find out whether they taste good. Hmm. I really love that. The lemon flavor that comes on in that um, in the in the paste here in the in the little puff part, and that uh, the whipped cream part that comes with the syllabub, that's got uh, the um, the sack flavor in it, or a little bit of you know even sparkling wine if you use that, that definitely gives it a whole different feel than just standard whipped cream. It can be a little harder to get to fluff up and. Uh, when you're trying it at home, you might want to try whipping the cream up first and then adding a little bit of that wine or sparkling wine to uh, get the flavor in there. Uh, but sometimes that can keep it from sort of fluffing up. So that's a, that's a good try there. But wow, they are excellent. Probably one of the very best of the desserts that we've done right here on 18th Century Cooking. And it's, uh, you know, it's one of those connections with a modern food and with an 18th century food. I love the connection with this. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. We are at the camp today. We're gonna be doing some wonderful camp cooking. I've gotta feed these guys because they're working on this cabin. So today we're gonna to be making a classic campfire, 18th century cornbread. 
We're in North America in the 18th century and cornmeal is one of those major provisions, one of those uh, things that you bring along with you uh, as either a soldier or someone on the frontier. One of those typical things you would carry along with you. Cornbread is such an easy, quick to make item. So that's what we're going to be making today. These guys have been working here for multiple days. We're like day three on the cabin, collecting the logs, setting them up. They need to be fed. Cornbread's like the perfect thing to go along with the stew that we're cooking. So let's get started on our just so simple 18th century cornbread. We've got about a pound of cornmeal here and we don't have an exact recipe. What we're gonna try to do really is get to a, a consistency. That's, that's really what we're trying to achieve here. And so we can use the uh, kind of ingredients that we might have available to us. So I've got some milk here. I, on the frontier, I may not have access to milk this particular situation. I've got some milk, uh, so I'm gonna add some in here. Well, wait, before I get to milk, let me add the, the other dry ingredient, and that is salt. This is gonna be so much better if I've got a little bit of salt, and salt's something you wanna take along with you on your camping trip, definitely. Definitely easier to get that salt mixed in nicely if it's still dry. Now we're gonna add in some of our wet ingredients that we have available. If you've just got water, water will work. If we've got some milk available, I'm gonna add some milk to this. That looks good. Let me stir that in, see what our consistency is like. There we go, that's still a little thick. That's good though, because I wanna add an egg or two. I happen to have some eggs with me. Again, if I don't have uh, eggs, that's okay. So there's one egg. We're gonna add this egg in because uh, we, we wanna have as much energy and sustenance as possible. So if we've got an egg available, we're gonna add that in. The last thing here is I'm gonna add water until I get to uh, the consistency where I can get this to pour. I don't, I don't want it to be super sloppy, but um, it should pour into our, the dish that we're gonna bake it in. There we go, we got the perfect consistency. This is gonna pour right into our baking dish. And it is that simple. We use the ingredients that we have available to us. And, and so many times in these situations, you may or may not have you know, one of these particular ingredients. You might not have an egg, you might not have butter, or you might not have milk. You can do it without these things and it'll still turn out great, especially when you're hungry. Our baking dish already has uh, some some butter in this or whatever oil that you might have available to you if you've been cooking and you've got bacon grease whatever you've got uh, you want to grease your pan uh, before you start baking in this so I've got my pan it's already got the, uh, the oil in it and now we're just gonna pour our uh, our mix in that was almost the perfect amount for this baking dish and uh, you might be worried that I've brought it right up to the top this is not gonna grow a lot. There is no leavening in this cornbread. It's just such a simple one that we can basically fill it almost to the very top. Now this has to go in our camp oven to bake. Our cornbread is on the fire. It's got coals on the top and the bottom. Probably gonna take 45 minutes to an hour, maybe even longer. Depends on how often I can get over there and check the heat. But while that's baking, I'm gonna get to work. Hey guys, here you go. Give you a try with this. Here you go. Here you go. Slippery. Hey, let's try this out, see how it turned out. Put a little bit of butter that I had uh, on these guys. Boy, that would fill you up. 
I got too big of a piece. That is superb. That is very filling, filled with energy and gives you something to chew on in the middle of the day while you're taking the break so you can get back to work. This recipe is so simple. Anyone can do it. And if you're out in the field, you don't have exactly the right ingredients. You can make it up as you go along. It's going to turn out just like they made it in the 18th century. Hey, the only thing that's missing is maybe a little bit of nutmeg. Thanks for coming along with us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today we're going to be doing this healthy, restorative, cooling drink from the 18th century, barley water. Thanks for coming along with us as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. It is hot today in Indiana. This is, we're just starting to get into the real heat of summer. And it's time to look at summertime drinks, drinks that you would use for cooling, for you know, restoring yourself after working outside. So today we're looking at barley water, sometimes called lemon barley water. And barley water is exactly that. It's not like a lemonade, a thin, you know, kind of insubstantial drink. This is a substantial drink that's meant to really restore you. Sometimes it would even use to, you know, recruit people that are poorly. Or uh, if you've been working outside, it's a, it's a drink for that. It's a cooling drink and it's not too difficult to make a lot of simple ingredients. Let's get started. This barley water recipe comes from The Complete Housewife. This is Eliza Smith, 1730. This is really one of my go-to cookbooks. It has a lot of great recipes in it. And let me read to you this barley water recipe real quick. Take pearl barley, four ounces, put it in a large pipkin, cover it with water. When the barley is thick and tender, put more water in, boil it up again, so tis, uh, t so do till tis a good thickness to drink. Then put in a blade of mace, put in a stick of cinnamon, let it have a walm or two, strain it out, squeeze in a lemon or two, and a bit of peel, sweeten to your taste with fine sugar, let it stand till it's cold, and then run it through a bag, bottle it, and it will keep a good three or four days. We're gonna simplify this just a little bit. Well, let's take four ounces of barley and put it on the boil. This has thickened up nicely. It's time to pour in our second water. It's gonna cool it back down. Uh, probably a quart, two quarts of water. And for the second warming, I'm gonna go ahead and put in our spices. So we've got our, uh, our cinnamon and we've got some mace here, which is the cousin to nutmeg, right? So those are gonna go in and then those are gonna come back up to a boil. I've allowed the barley water to cool, at least to sort of, you know, room temperature. Let's start to add some sugar in and then do a little taste test. See if we get the right kind of, again, we're supposed to sugar to taste. Let's give this a try. Mm. Could use could use the rest of it. There you go. That should be about right. Now uh, let's put in our lemon juice and I've got a lemon here and a lot of people ask on the channel about lemons in the 18th century and they, um, while they might not have been easy for regular folks, uh, maybe in North America, to uh, get a hold of lemons, they were certainly advertised and you would see them uh, quite often uh, in the advertisements all through the 18th century. Um, so they, they were definitely available and being imported. 
So our barley water is ready to cool off. We do want our barley water to be as cool as possible. So we're gonna bottle this up. And we're gonna tie a rope around it and, and uh, lower it down into the well, submerge it in that water so it can cool off. Or if you have a spring house where the spring comes right out of the hill, uh, you, can, you can put your bottle right there in the spring, cool it off. We want this to be as cool as possible. Well, here's our nice, cool, restorative drink. It's ready to try out. It's been, you know, kind of setting for quite a while. I've got a little bit of lemon peel. I'm gonna to toss that in there. It looks like a nice, strong lemonade, doesn't it? But it's just got a very light lemon uh, scent to it. And I'm really intrigued about the body of this and what it, what it tastes like. So let's find out. Oh, wow. It's almost like um, it's like a very, very thin pudding or something. It's got some real body to it. And I can, you know, if it, when it's nice and cool like this, it, uh, it isn't too sweet. And obviously you, you get a chance to sweeten this up as much as or as little as you like, but it doesn't need a lot of sweetness. It can really give you a lot of, uh, say, fluids and you know, who knows, uh, electrolytes? I don't know what's in there, but uh, this is used many times in a, uh, in a medicinal context, and I can see why. It really feels like it's something that can uh, kind of refresh you in a new kind of way, rather than just water or just a sickly sweet lemonade. It's really a tremendous drink. Mm. So good, so good. It's, it, and it's one of these sort of, you know, lost drinks, isn't it? We don't, we don't hear about barley water uh, very often today, so it's really something you, you should try out. Welcome to 18th Century Cooking. I'm your host, John Townsend. Today I've got a couple special guests, Natalie and Tara. We'll be doing a three-course meal from the 18th century. This is going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us today as we savor the flavors and the aromas of the 18th century. Before we get started, let me introduce our guests, or they can introduce themselves. Tell me about Natalie and Tara. Well, um, we are Natalie and Tara, and we do a show on YouTube called Natalie and Tara Try Stuff, a show in which we try things for the first time. And we've done everything from parasailing to deboning a rabbit, and uh, we've done a couple of your recipes, and they've turned out great, and they've turned out so-so because we are not cooks. <laughs> So, what, you've done um, mushroom ketchup, right? Yes. That was good. That was really good. What else have you done? Uh, meat, meat pudding, is that what it's called? Yes. Yeah, that, that was, that was just yeah. We, we had suet issues, but... Yeah. <laughs> Everyone does. I don't think we nailed it, but it was still really tasty. Yeah. And Switchel, you did your own twist yes, on that? Switchel. Oh, we just kept adding rum. There you go. Yeah. yeah. There we go. That uh, sounds like a lot of fun. Make sure to check out their uh, channel. There'll be a link down in the description section. So we're gonna be doing like a three course feast here today and we've got three different dishes, right? So uh, this one we would call a pot roast. They, they called it something like rump ragu, right? <laughs> you, you look at that, rump ragu. And, uh, but that one's from 1794. That one's uh, domestic economy, uh, Maximilian Hasselmore. And he like collects some recipes together like so many cookbooks do. Mm -hmm. uh, that one's gonna be the tough one. We'll be doing some prep work on that one. We've got onion rings or just fried onions with a special ingredient. Uh, that one's Mollard from 1802 or so. And then uh, our our, um, our dessert, you guys picked that out? Yeah, we picked the syllabub because we've been dying to try it. The syllabub <laughs> is gonna be really good and we could we can do a lot. These are just suggestion recipes, really. We can do a lot of different things with these and make them really fun. And that one's from about um, 1730. Uh, so that's a, a, an early one, but syllabubs are, well, they're still popular, if you ask me. So <laughs> uh, we're going to do this tough one first, uh, this, this, um, this pot roast. And so there's going to be a lot of prep work. So uh, let me get you started on a couple little things. Let's go. We need the carrots peeled, okay. uh, and I don't have a peeler, of course, because that's not 18th century. So okay. uh, we've got some giant knives, or so little ones, <laughs> and uh, we need our, our potatoes cut in half, uh -huh. and our mushrooms cut in half, and we need a, an onion 
with cloves uh, put in it. So are you so, familiar? I'm not familiar with that okay. at all. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, we're going to cut the top and the bottom off of it, take the peel off, obviously, till we get down that. And we're going to take cloves and uh, put them in a couple of rows uh, okay. here around the outside. Mm -hmm. And um, there okay. you go. We okay. go. Have at it. Great. So there's, there you go, some knives. This, I will do carrots. Okay. Because okay, that was the one that was scaring me. I'll do this right. one. What <laughs> knife? So, there you yeah, go. Yeah, it okay. looks like a knife. Great. Okay, we're going to go. We're just doing this. Yeah, we yeah. got it. Okay. So I've got the easy part. I'm just going to flour this nice big piece of uh, beef. Just got some plain old flour. I'm going to flour this up. Okay. Okay. I got it. I can do this. No, I got this. I got this. And you I can, can just this. scrape it if you want. You don't necessarily oh, have to cut it off. off. You can just scrape it. Huge chunks She's of She's dangerous tear. over there. So kind of what's tough about this particular one is that it's got a lot of steps. And obviously, I didn't pick this one out. Um, <laughs> And what, what we have to do is uh, get this beef frying up. We're going to brown it. It's a giant chunk to get browned. So we're, we got to brown this up. This will take 15 minutes. Uh, then we're going to dump some ingredients in and cook it for an hour. And then we're going to dump more ingredients <laughs> in and cook it for another, you know, who knows how long. So this one's kind of complicated, uh, but it certainly turns out really good. But dumping ingredients, I can handle dumping ingredients. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty, <laughs> much, it it's pretty much, you know, dump this in, dump that in uh, it's it's more about the timing so we're going to cook this in um in our camp kettle or in our dutch oven and this uh, is we're going to do this over the campfire and with coals and all that you could you could do this in your oven at home mm -hmm. if you it, wanted to do which is what we would do yeah. that's prettier yeah, <laughs> I want this, that. This, one, this one's fun so uh i'm going to put a little bit of oil in this we're going to cook these things outdoors today i'm going to go out to the campfire and get this get this cooking awesome Okay, the carrots look great, the potatoes look good, and you've got this beautiful onion with cloves. Uh, while that is frying out there, we have to wait for this, uh, the rest of this one. We're going to move on to the next one, uh, which is the onions fried with Parmesan. We've got some awesome. onions here. Uh, and it calls for mild onions, so I actually picked out sweet onions for this instead of the kind of spicy, you know... Uh, Spanish onions. So mm -hmm. we need to cut these up, cut off the top and the bottom, peel the skin off, and then we're going to be, you know, carefully taking full slices off here. Now he doesn't actually say to turn them into the rings. He oh. he, he implies that we're actually frying the whole slices, uh, oh. but of course we're going to turn them into rings because okay. it's more fun. Right. It's more right. Fun. Who doesn't like a ring? So who's, who's <laughs> going to who's going to do the chopping? I chop. Okay, there good, because I was scared. Careful. <laughs> so with these, like, onion rings to me are fair food. Was this a common, like, dinner uh, item? No, this is probably, this is probably pretty fancy food. Oh, Ooh. really? Right. Uh, it's it's um, something that would be one of those fancy things that's set off on the side of the table uh, that you would, you know, oh, give me one of those. It's not it's not a main dish, but oh. it, it is a kind of a, probably a fancy food for the table. Was it that it was fried that made it fancy, or that it was onion that made it fancy? Well, there's the there's the Parmesan cheese that we're going to oh. put in here, okay. and uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I think you know nowadays we think of fried food as a uh, as fair food because it's one of the easy ways to cook things, and everybody likes fried stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it is it is probably higher a higher end thing for the oh, well wow. okay I didn't know that I have been fancy for many years <laughs> yeah and again these are suggestions you don't have to be perfect <laughs> I love that about older recipes like yeah. the it's just like an end of this and you're like well but how much of the this and <sighs> it's all it works a, out you get the sense that people just kind of knew, like, well, yeah, I got I right. I can sense how much I would mm -hmm. put as a recipe, and my grandmother taught me this, so like. They just kind of knew, and like, we don't cook, so we need, like, um, but yeah. how much butter? Can I have to oh. the butter? That one's mine. <laughs> <laughs> and they, I think they had different expectations, Yeah. Too. They, they were, you know, we know, it's like every onion ring has got to be like this. Oh, it's like, no, yeah. no, it doesn't have to be like that. We mm, can make them any I way we see. want. 
we have our onions all cut up and ready. Uh, now it's time to get the, our, our batter going and let's set this, push this stuff aside. Let's get our batter bowl into the, mm -hmm. uh, into the thing. You, you're gonna be- Oh, I'm whisking. Are you all about whisking, right? right. Cause we've got a, we got a mega whisk project coming Great. up. <laughs> not, not this one, but uh, this is supposed to be half a jill of cream. That's more than a half a jill of cream, but we're gonna live with that <laughs> uh, because this is just batter, right? We're gonna mix some flour in there. Can I whisk start, start that in a little it? bit. Could you chop our Parmesan? I've shaved this off, but we really need it to be in little grated. Got so it. just hack at that <laughs> until it turns into little bits. And uh, we're gonna add some egg into this. And mm -hmm. We should, probably should have done this in another, you know, we should have probably done the egg first and put it, but we're not gonna do that. We don't we're gonna do it the hard way, <laughs> which is the way I do everything, usually the wrong way or the hard way. <laughs> That sounds like our show. Yeah. There we go. Like <laughs> do I need more? Yes. More? Yes. There's always more. I do I like cheese. He called for up to a quarter of a cup. So, oh, okay. I mean, you can't go wrong, right? You just keep. I mean, just, just more. Going, right? And we have more than and half a jill of cream, so we need right. extra. Right. And, okay. Okay. And this is again, these are suggestions. They aren't. Uh, there's only only about half the ingredients have a, a quantity, so mm -hmm. we really actually don't know. Uh, the perfect thing to do. And when so. they say quantities, they say things like Jill. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And those can vary depending on what country mm. uh, or even the time period that the, the, the recipe was written. Oh, so it might wow. say a Jill and one year it means this amount and another year it might mean something else. Oh, wow. Like a Scottish pint is different than an English pint. So. Okay, guys, we're going yeah. to get together on this. Right, right. No, no. That's what the 18th century is yeah. all about. Oh, my goodness. So you're stirring with this. We're, oh. We need to actually, we need it to, to oh. you know, I I'm should so use a deeper about, bowl. I'm but, so scared of spilling it. Oh, well, this is all about spilling. <laughs> uh, we're going to add some salt and pepper while we're here. I like pepper. Am I whisking now? Yes. yes okay. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> is this yes. now whisking? We're going to have some salt in here. Toss that cheese in. Okay, okay. All the cheese. Yes. Oh, there's cheese is gonna fly, guys. This is, there's no way the cheese is staying in this bowl. <laughs> this is prep work. We are not going to cook these right away because we don't want to cook them very far ahead of when we're gonna serve them, obviously, because three old, three hour old onion rings are not the best. So, uh, but these are all prepped and ready to go. We're gonna set this aside. We're gonna bring in our roast and, and do the next step on it. Awesome, all right. Okay, here we go. This has been on the fire browning. Oh, that looks there you good. Go. <laughs> that smells go. amazing. It smells great. We got some juices working around in there, which is exactly what we want. We're gonna knock this over. <laughs> there we go. That's good. Oh yeah. Um, in goes um, it's small beer. We don't have a small beer. We could use an alcoholic cider. If you don't have that, just plain cider or mm -hmm. uh, beer. Okay. So we're gonna use this, uh, well, our beer today is a lot like a light beer, the, or a, you know, a small a beer. A small beer. Right. And we've got a, uh, our onion goes in. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go ahead and put the carrots in. There you go. Whoa, Bam. look Ooh, out. Oh, sorry, excited. Uh, some potatoes. We've got some sweet herbs. I've got some uh, rosemary here. If we had some time, we would toss that in, but we're running out of time. <laughs> uh, I've got a piece of lemon peel. Do we have some whole peppercorns? Oh, yes, they're hiding yes. right here. Whole peppercorns, so about half a dozen, eight whole peppercorns. That's four. And, uh, that's, uh, that's seven. Yeah, yeah this is Close <laughs> enough, close enough. And we're gonna add a little bit of salt to that. Pinch of um, this, a pinch of that? Yes. No. No? Uh, what is it here? <laughs> we used it in that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this, we're going to knock these things down a little bit. And this goes back uh, on the fire, but it does, doesn't go on a frying fire. This was over a fire, mm -hmm. uh, but now it goes over a low and slow fire. If you're going to do it in your oven uh, at home, you would put this in your oven at it's like 300 degrees or so, mm -hmm. really low, and let it cook for hours. So mm -hmm. an hour, two hours, three hours, uh, something like that. Uh, depends on how big that piece of meat is. Right. This one, hour and a half maybe or so. And then we'll do a little bit of work with it right at the very end. Okay. Uh, but right now this is gonna go on coals. I'm gonna put this on a bed of coals underneath, put coals on top so it gets heat from both mm -hmm. sides. So this goes back out to the fire. Awesome, great.
So it's been about an hour and a half. Let's go check on our roast and see what it looks like. And you can see with the lid off here that everything is cooking down. It's looking like it's very, very cooked. Uh, we need to do a, a quick step here where we're doing the ragu part. I've got some chopped mushrooms. We're gonna add in some flour here and we're just getting this thickened up. And as soon as this feels like it's the right thickness, we can put our the meat back in, the potatoes, the carrots back in, and then we're gonna let this kind of simmer around again, again, a little bit more, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. And we're getting rid of that onion and the lemon, right? Yeah, we don't need the, the onion uh, with the clove in that anymore. We're not gonna eat that. That really was just there to flavor it. And the, the, the really the whole idea with the onion is that it's the easiest way to get those cloves out of there, right? Right. Oh. So instead of having to scrape around in there and find all those little pieces of clove, which boy, you bite into a clove, you know it. Uh, that, that way we can just toss those all out. Brilliant. That right. is brilliant. So our pot roast is on the fire, still kind of doing this little finish up thing. Um, onion rings would be next, but we want those to be fresh, right? We mm -hmm. don't want them to sit around. So we're gonna work on our final uh, dish here second. If that makes any sense at all. And we're, these are whipped syllabubs. And we start off with, we've got a couple of base drinks here. There's a, there's a Madeira, a port, and a white wine. Mm -hmm. And she actually calls for them to be sweetened right up front. Now, mm, the port and the Madeira are probably already right. pretty sweet. Yeah. I don't know that they need a lot. The white wine might need a little sweetening. I've got some sugar here. Mm -hmm. And are there some spoons over there? Yes. You can go ahead and chuck in some uh, sugar. Don't ask me how much. Did, you ask, did she say anything? Yeah, no, no. Okay, but she no, just okay, says sweeten to do taste. It. Just do and it. then stir that around until it's uh, dissolved. Now we've got, uh, we're gonna do the whipping part and we've got some cream here. She calls for a whole bunch of cream. So we got some heavy whipping cream. Lots of cream. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and uh, she calls for sack to go in this. Of course, sack isn't a drink there or a wine that we talk mm -hmm. about today. It's not referenced in any modern thing, but it's a sherry, right? Oh, oh okay. So uh, at least as close as we're gonna get is a sherry. Mm -hmm. So we've got some sherry, we're gonna toss that in. Again, we don't know how much. Some, 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 some. but we do have the measurement on lemon juice, which doesn't really make any, any sense whatsoever. <laughs> uh, but the juice of two lemons, we're gonna toss that in. Now it comes the hard part. This has to be whisked up until it really gets uh, thick, frothy. So, and I'd love somebody else so to do that. a long time. <laughs> We're just gonna take turns. Right. I think that looks good. Now the froth gets spooned into the top of these. Go for it, Tara. Okay, here we go. You're gonna need a lot more than that. I'm gonna go a little bit of time though. <laughs> okay, okay, I feel I feel braver now. Okay. okay. Would you wait to put the the cream on top of when you're ready to serve, or would you? I, or I, does it take a matter? I all? would have a if if I had my choice, I would mm -hmm. chill these a little bit. I would mm -hmm. go ahead and put it, you know, oh. do that mm -hmm. and just like. Stay. Okay. Well, well, I'm just gonna move on to the next one now. Just gonna keep going until <laughs> yeah. so you guys stop me. <laughs> I was like, I don't know Rotate. what you're eating. a spoon, maybe. <laughs> well, you do kind of eat it with a spoon. Yeah, Look how nice mess. that yeah, one is, well, and this one is not. Look, okay. Tara's <laughs> <laughs> so better at things than I am. <laughs> so these, just, just oh. slower. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So these would be for like a fancy party. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like a big winter's ball or mm -hmm. something. I don't get to serve at a fancy party because nope. I make a mess. And nope. Let me just clean that. There. We can turn it this you way. You are disinvited to the ball. <laughs> there. That seems right. Okay. Good. We can set these aside. I'm gonna go ahead and set these on the side table here. Now, getting very, very close to the end, we should we should get those onion rings going. So we're gonna get up by the fire and at the our. Oil should be hot by now. We've already made the onion rings. We've already made the batter. Let's, let's go out and do it. So close. <laughs>
Well, what do you guys think? It's beautiful. It smells amazing. <laughs> Dive in. The question is, yeah, what does it, it taste, taste like? I guess. So <laughs> okay. let's uh, let's and I and I gave you the lesson about how to eat with these knives and forks. Just learn, so don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> let's see what we can get right here. So the whole key is, of course, you can't pick up your food with your fork, or else you might you might stab yourself. So everything is, well, it's a lot more difficult. <laughs> this is like so far away from your mouth. <laughs> you going in? Are you going onion right? Yes. Hey, the onion rings are good. Mm. They're very good. That's very, very, very That's good. Sorry, so now I'm speaking good. in my mouthful. <laughs> if I had a choice, maybe I'd put even more Parmesan cheese on the onion, onion rings. Ring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was my department. Not enough. The meat is very tender. Oh, so tender. Tender, very nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little more mushroom ketchup in that. You can always have more mushroom ketchup. Oh, that is good. Like with the Parmesan and the, mm -hmm. and oh, the yeah. batter. It's very good. Those onions are amazing. I love that. Mm. I got this. I got this. Mmm. Mm -hmm. nice. That is really good. Mmm. Oh, wait, we haven't tried this yet. That's right. We have. We go straight to dessert now. Yes. yes. We get to skip dessert okay. and We're meal. sampling everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. How do I do this? I oh, we're just. Uh, we could. We could stir it up. Oh, okay. Or we can just take a little spoon off. We can get a little bit of both. Oh yeah, because there's booze in the whipped cream, right? Yes. Oh good. Yes, yes. This one could, I could should have sugared this a little bit. Oh, that's very unique. I don't mm. taste this part. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just mm -hmm. even. Ooh. I want to stir. Hold it. Mm -hmm. I want to stir, stir. I'm gonna make myself a drink hole here. <laughs> I'm just gonna drink it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ooh, I like it. So good. And this is all just so well cooked. Yeah. I was surprised at how moist this ended up being. Mm -hmm. So good. Go back. Go back. I'm going back in. Dinner, dessert, dinner, dessert. All right? Mm -hmm. Jump around. Thank you, Natalie and Tara, for joining us for this wonderful three course meal. Thanks you for sharing the cooking and doing all that hard work. Like, <laughs> thank you for that. 